Well, good evening. I'm Tara Rack, pastor of Anchorage Presbyterian Church, and we are so glad that you've joined us this evening. As a, as a passage from Matthew 25 says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Jesus calls us to serve with and for the least of these, not as a group to be pitied, but as people who are deeply loved by Jesus. We aim to multiply this loving commitment to radical and fearless discipleship, and that is what our commitment to be a Matthew 25 church means to us. Following Jesus faithfully means putting love and compassion to action. Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of Matthew resembles the love ethic described by thinkers such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So here we are, ready to learn and discuss the realities of our people, of God's people. As I said last week, this won't be easy, but it is what we are called to do. Since this is our purpose, let us pray. Merciful God, your call to discipleship is demanding. You call us to reorder our lives by the teachings of Scripture. Yet we still pass by the ones you especially notice. People who are poor and hungry. People who weep. People who are sick. People who are imprisoned. We have not stood with those who are hated, bullied, and excluded. Comfortable with the way things are, we are too complacent and even complicit with, our, with injustice and prejudice. Forgive us, O oh God, and turn us back to you this Lenten season. Open our hearts so that all may have a place at the table. Amen. Our second speaker of the series is Bill Wilson. And Bill is a retired attorney and volunteer for Hand in Hand Ministry. He is also um, on the board of Middletown Christian, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, following his career in the courtroom, he also volunteers several places, and I'm sure you can fill us in a little more about that. But we are so pleased to have Bill Wilson here with us this evening. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? All right, great. I'm going to give that to you just so I don't mess it up. Uh, Thanks for having me tonight. I was excited to be here because this is uh, a homecoming of sorts for me because I went to school across the tracks through the ninth grade. So uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, I was a regular uh, around here and I have great memories of Anchorage Press because I think it was at Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter, we always marched over here for the uh, services. Uh, as part of the school program. And I also went to school uh, at Anchorage when busing was kind of, uh, you know, a, a hot topic here locally. And there were a couple of times when bomb threats were called into the school. And Miss Ewing, the longtime superintendent, said, this is nonsense. So when that would happen, she would advise us, everybody would pick their stuff up and come over here and set up shop here until we got the all clear. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here and also being uh, sort of uh, knowing something about the history of Anchorage Presbyterian. I know what a rich heritage you have in community involvement, and I'm honored to be a part of that. So what we're going to talk about tonight is redlining, probably a topic or a phrase that many of you have heard about. Um, but we're going to look at it from some of its origins. Uh, and just to kind of give you a road map of what we're doing today, I am going to be discussing some of the origins of redlining. Uh, as the first part, then we're going to shift gears a little bit and we're actually going to take a property and look at how redlining affects properties today. And not only properties, but some of the ancillary effects of redlining, such as utilities, trying to find a contractor, even listing your house. These are all some of the legacies that, uh, that have come from redlining. So, just to give you a little more background on me, uh, I am, and also this is sort of an Anchorage note, I've always been a history buff. 
Uh, I've always enjoyed history. I've always liked it from, from an early age. And that was spurred in great deal by the longtime librarian at Anchorage, Mary Alice Hayes. So she kind of uh, lit that fire and it still burns. Um, but I have no academic training in this subject. I have no real vocational training in this subject. I'm strictly an amateur. And that's based on uh, reading quite a bit. I've gone to a number of lectures. I've heard people that are a lot smarter and wiser than me talk about it. Uh, and also, some of this has come from people having personal experience and sharing that with me. Uh, one of my first retirement gigs was uh, with Hand in Hand Ministries, which is a local charity here. It was originally started by Father Joe Fowler at Holy Trinity Parish. It is not affiliated with the Catholic Church anymore, but it is based on a concept of going into communities and not telling people what they need, but asking them what they need and not giving people a handout, but the phrase is, give you a hand up. And this organization for many years has had an operation in Belize where they build houses. Uh, a crew goes down and in a week you start the house, you build the house, you finish the house, and you dedicate the house. And you do that with the family that's getting the house and all of their neighbors, etc. It is a 21st century barn raising. And they've built over 400 with this model. Uh, they also have an operation in Belize where they do some house building, but that's mostly a focus on education. Uh, the schools in Nicaragua are abysmal and it's trying to, to give uh, students a quality education. And finally, for many years, they've had an operation in Auksher, a coal mining town, a former coal mining town in Floyd County, uh, done a lot of home repair, et cetera. So the operation was based here in Louisville, and for many years, uh, the director and the board were asked, hey, you're doing all this stuff in other countries and other parts of the state, why aren't, why aren't you doing anything in your own backyard? And finally, in 2017, that happened, and they have an operation based at 26 and Portland Avenue in the Portland community. Uh, and for the first time, they were able to bring groups to Louisville and do similarly what we've done in these other areas. There's a, there's a dorm at the facility, so colleges, parishes, churches, just interested people come from literally all over the United States and uh, foreign countries uh, and spend a week here and help with whatever project is on the boards. Uh, a lot of universities do it. Uh, Villanova, Holy Cross, Boston University, a number of these colleges have come. And it was a great experience. But while they were here, we said, well, we don't want just to have them do work. We also want to have, you know, talk about some of the topics that are front and center here. And we developed a series of lectures, uh, everything from climate change, AKA flooding, uh, a little bit about health, uh, and we did one uh, exploring the heritage of West Louisville, and we developed this one on redlining. And we initially did this just for groups that were coming from out of town. If anybody was coming locally, were coming down for a few days, we didn't do that because, well, they're local, right? Well, what we learned pretty quickly was people in Louisville don't know any more about West Louisville than if you're coming from Philadelphia or Chicago or Kansas City or Ireland. So this became a regular uh, rotation in what we would do with the local groups as well. And I think of all the uh, presentations, topics that we've done, redlining has gotten more feedback than any. So that's kind of what, what my background is on doing this. It's kind of a passion of mine. And I also hope, uh, because we're going to leave plenty of time for questions and comments, what I have found is I've always learned something from these presentations. I've always had somebody either ask a question, make a comment that, that has been helpful. The final thing I will tell you is I welcome feedback as well. So if you liked something that we did tonight, that's great. If you really didn't like something you did, I did tonight, or if you just looked at it and say, I don't know where you were going with this, let me know. Because this presentation has evolved continuously over the last five or six years. So with that, we're going to get started. One of the things I am going to do today is challenge you a little bit. The phrase that we have on the screen right now, owning a home is a keystone of wealth, both financial affluence and emotional security. And that comes from the financial guru, Susie Orman. How many people here would agree with that statement or have heard that statement and think that's pretty sound advice? Well, how many of us 
have sort of followed that philosophy over the last 40 years or whatever. Sure, right? Well, would we call that the American dream, in fact? You know, owning your own home, having that independence, having that security, having that sense of community. So that would, I think, very often many people consider that a bedrock of the American dream. Well, what we're going to do today by talking about some areas and some properties, I want to sort of turn that conventional wisdom on its head a little bit, and I'm going to challenge you to examine that and think, why is that maybe something that we consider as homeowners in certain areas of the community as bedrocks, but maybe if we were homeowners in other communities or other parts of the community, we would consider it not true. What is redlining? Who can give me, and I have to warn you in advance, I wander and I'm really good about grabbing people for comments. So uh, I'm sorry about that in advance. It probably should have been a disclaimer before you came tonight. I'm not here to embarrass anybody and I won't, but I do like a little bit of interactive uh, participation. So can somebody tell me, anybody, just you, you, many of us have heard the term, if you could put, if you could define redlining in a sentence, what would it be? Just anybody, jump in. I see somebody pointing already, so okay. Okay, loan risk based on geography. Anybody else want to throw something in on that? Other side of the tracks, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry? discrimination. Uh, anybody want to throw income discrimination in there? Yeah. So obviously you have some sense of what redlining is and certainly some of the effects of redlining. What we want to first explore is some of the origins. How many of you have read the book by uh, Richard Rothstein, Color of Law? Published in 2017, yeah. It was it was sort of groundbreaking research. It is, a, it is a great book. He does some really in-depth history on redlining and some of the effects. Uh, I highly recommend it as a read. I don't agree with some of his conclusions, whatever reason he didn't ask me before he wrote it, but it is a great read and I would highly recommend it. But what's interesting is this book came out late 2016, early 2017. Two locals actually did what I consider some of the seminal research on um, redlining in the United States, and these two figures behind me, Josh Poe and Jeannie Dunlop. Josh, at the time, was a graduate student um, in the uh, College of Urban Planning at UofL, and he started digging into some of the origins and some of the background on redlining. He was a graduate student, uh, had a couple of kids, and had no money, and at one point had to borrow $200 from somebody to pay the copying fees that the National Archives wanted to send him some of the research he was digging. The other lady is Jeannie Dunlop. Jeannie has uh, served in a variety of roles in Louisville Metro government. She helped fund some of this and was also part of some of the, of, of the initial research to the point where Jeannie got a Harvard Fellowship for a semester uh, as a result of this. So we have two local folks that I would say probably did some of the earliest and most groundbreaking research on this topic. So now let's talk a little bit about its origins. And you can go way back and, and there's a lot of different threads that you can look at. I'm gonna narrow the focus just a little bit and we're gonna start in the 1920s. Uh, some people call it the jazz age, but it was an age where there was a lot of activity on a lot of fronts. It was sort of the beginning of, of, the cons of what we would call the modern consumer economy. Uh, people really, America really went, uh, got on wheels with Henry Ford and the Model T. Uh, you had a lot of different things going on during that, that time period. And to coin a phrase from a later Federal Reserve Chairman, it was an age of irrational exuberance. And as all ages of irrational exuberance uh, occurs, it crashed. 
beginning in 1929. Uh, with the arrival of the Great Depression, uh, the economy, as most of us remember from the history books, I'm sure nobody here lived through it, uh, really cratered. And people were put out on their street, were put out on the streets, you know. The, the, the number of farms and mortgages that were underwater was just simply staggering. And uh, a lot of people just were literally out on the streets. Uh, and people lost their jobs you know, bread lines and that sort of thing. Just as an aside, and I do this periodically as we go through this, you probably have seen this photo before. This photo is shown a lot with the Great Depression. Anybody know the background on this photo? I know where it was taken. You know where it was taken. See, I knew we'd have somebody. Tell me, who took it and where was it taken? Uh-huh. Yep. It's a, it, yeah. This was taken by the pioneering photographer Margaret Bourke-White on assignment for Life magazine here in late January of 1937 in the Russell community, as you just mentioned. Uh, it was actually uh, flood victims from the 37 flood, but it's a photo that you see a lot, and of course it's got so much irony in it. Uh, but. It, it certainly is an illustration of a lot of things that were happening during the Depression in terms of, you know, we probably have never had the mass unemployment that we've had during that time period. Uh, and banks failed. Now that's one thing, thankfully, that we haven't seen since the Great Depression, and I hope we don't, is there was no federal deposit insurance. So if you had a lot of mortgages that were bad and a lot of loans that were bad, uh, the bank just failed, which meant if you did, hadn't hightailed it down there first to get your uh, deposits in cash, you were out of luck. And that happened a great deal all across the country, but particularly in rural areas. Uh, the construction industry tanked was another thing. Think about the number of buildings that you are aware of, houses that were built between 1930 and 1940. It's not very many. Uh, so construction teams, unlike this group at Rockefeller Center, were for the most part out of work. So of course, that culminated in 1932 at the election of Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt takes office in March of 1933 as the, the whole economic decline had really picked up steam to the points where states were defaulting on payrolls, banks were closing, it was a really, really dire situation. So one of the first things that the New Deal did was close the banks because they didn't know which banks were solvent, which banks weren't, you know, how many people were losing their money. So, you know, messaging is not just a 21st century phenomenon. So what do you do when you close the banks? Well, you declare a bank holiday, which is what they did. Uh, every bank in the United States was closed. The financial system of the United States ground to a halt. And over a period of time, they had to basically reinvent it. And we're all probably familiar with a lot of the New Deal legislation, the 100 days uh, 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 period. One of the things that came shortly after the beginning of the New Deal, but early on, was the National Housing Act of 1934, better known to us as the FHA. And the FHA had a lot of different components, but the idea was how do we create uh, a, a housing market that is stable, uh, that, that people don't lose their homes, they don't lose their money, et cetera. So it really was the birth of the modern mortgage system that we're all pretty much familiar with. And its legislative purpose, very high-flown language here, is to encourage improvement in housing standards and conditions to provide a system of mutual mortgage insurance and for other purposes. All sounds pretty good, right? And it was. I mean, there was a strong reason why this had to be done. Um, and, but it, very often it was almost creating thing from whole cloth. One of the uh, components of the 34 Act was they had to somehow come up with some basis for how do you even uh, 
assess a, a mortgage and, you know, and, and its risk and, and all of the other factors when you're making a determination if you're going to extend a loan on property. So all major communities in the United States, there was the creation of what we call residential security maps. That was part of the Homeowners Loan Corporation. That's the insignia there. And these residential security maps are really sort of the origin of when we talk about redlining, that's what we're talking about. So we're going to turn now to Louisville and specifically what some of these residential security maps in Louisville look like. And this is going to be circa, this map dates from about 1937. This is a map of Louisville with the residential security maps and they're color coded. Um, you can kind of see Louisville at the time, of course, looked much different than it does today. It was much more densely concentrated, et cetera, uh, along the river and, and just, you know, immediately south of the river. But now we're going to break down what all of this uh, hieroglyphics means. There were four types of classification of residential property. Type A was the best. It was in green. All right, and in fact, that label best is not my label. That's actually what the type A classes were called. They were the best category. This is actually language. This is some of the stuff that Josh Poe pulled from the National Archives. A lot of this stuff was hiding in plain sight for many years, but until he started digging, nobody really knew what was there. So for each of these districts or each of these areas, there was also commentary, what, you know, what they based this rating on. So this best rating would have been associated with areas such as Mockingbird Valley and Indian Hills. Uh, why were they rated type A? Well, they were homogenous. That's a good thing in 1937. Free of Negro or Jewish populations. And the final, they were considered the highest restricted areas. That's a direct quote and that is considered a very much a positive. So that would have been the best type A. So when you look at these maps, um, and it's one of these things you can Google because they're out there so frequently now, you'll see the green areas, those are the best. You know, some areas around Cherokee Park would have been considered that, that as well. Now we're gonna say type B, which is blue, still desirable, still desirable. Examples would be the Highlands and the original St. Matthews. Once again, this is a direct quote, hot spots not likely to be infiltrated. Infiltration is a word you see a lot, okay? Obviously, infiltration is a bad thing, but infiltration is a word, is one of those buzz phrases you see in a lot of these maps. All right, once again, you can see green. You can kind of, I know it may be kind of hard to see from here, but most of the green you're going to have over in the east end. Um, there is one green district over in West Louisville. That far green district on the right is, um, um, that's around the Shawnee neighborhood. That's around the Shawnee neighborhood. Now, we're getting into the sketchier areas. Type C, which is yellow. Declining is what it's called. Example would be Clifton. Once again, a direct quote, infiltration of a lower income group gradually moving in. Anybody want to take a stab at what a lower income group would predominantly consist of? African Americans, absolutely. So this is declining, AKA a lot more risk if you're making a mortgage. Finally, and you can see where the yellows are. A lot of West Louisville is yellow. Uh, you know, you get down over, you know, over into the Clifton, Germantown, Snitzelberg areas. Uh, now, we have one more classification. Type D is red. Now, if you look back here at the original color, it looks a lot more like maybe rose or mauve, but let's face it, rose lining and mauve lining just doesn't have the same ring, I guess. So, it's called red, and this is, what is red? Hazardous. That's the, that is the, 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 the label associated with type D. Examples would be Smoketown and Portland. Detrimental influences in a pronounced degree, infiltration of an undesirable population. So type D is hazardous. Just by that very definition, you're gonna get a lot of loans in a hazardous area? Probably not. 
So once again, this just gives a general map, circa 1937, of the major residential districts in Louisville. Now when you see white uh, in some areas, the outlying areas in white would have been farmland, the areas concentrated in downtown would have either been businesses or would have been rail yards or some manufacturing or something like that. So now let's turn to some areas that would be considered hazardous. Uh, this is Walnut Street uh, in downtown Louisville. It's actually at 8th and Walnut, now of course Ali, and it's looking east uh, toward downtown. Uh, at the time, this was the, probably the most prosperous, active, engaged African-American neighborhood in Louisville. Uh, it was, you know, it had African-American bus owned businesses, uh, you had places, you had theaters, the, the Top Hat Club was there, Drew Ellington and a lot of other uh, preeminent uh, musicians of the day. Um, we're going to talk in a minute about what happened to some of these areas. This is Harlan Bartholomew. Harlan Bartholomew is the, is the father of American urban planning in the United States. Uh, he ran the planning office for many years in St. Louis and also had a side gig as a consultant, went all over the United States consulting, including Louisville. And Harlan did quite a few sketches for Louisville. In fact, this is their proposal for the Louisville waterfront. Uh, I don't get downtown as much as I used to, but I think we would all probably agree the Louisville waterfront doesn't look like that today and never looked like that. But a lot of sketches and planning were made in Louisville, including some of these areas that I just mentioned, uh, uh, the African-American enclaves near Louisville. For instance, this would have been another view of that area, probably from about, say, 7th Street on the right over to 10th Street on the left. You're looking south, and that building you see way in the background is the L&N building. So that just kind of orients you. You can see it's a very densely populated area, uh, predominantly African-American. That's a similar view taken about 1980. Now, what happened? Well, uh, it didn't just happen here. It happened in communities all across the United States. I just threw this in because this is the west end of Cincinnati, one of the most densely populated areas in the United States uh, in 1940. Uh, and it was totally obliterated today. If you've ever crossed that horrible bridge going up on I-71, you look over to your left, that's what, you, that's what it used to be. It's all gone. Uh, once again, that was a, uh, uh, some of the heritage of Bartholomew's planning and design um, uh, influence. This is a design that they also made specifically in uh, some of those neighborhoods that we were just talking in the Russell neighborhood, very close to downtown. As you can see, this is a Negro housing survey. Uh, the little uh, Rorschach drawing over on the left is how it, is, it existed at the time they did this in the late 30s. Over on the right is their proposal uh, for a, a housing project. Uh, actually, that came pretty close to what it was. It was it's Beecher Terrace. Beecher Terrace, of course, has recently been uh, uh, redeveloped. But so many of these near uh, to the center of Louisville neighborhoods that were African-American, lower-income neighborhoods were simply obliterated with urban renewal and some of the other proposals for redevelopment. So now we're at the end of World War II. Uh, we finally have sort of gotten through the Depression. We have these new uh, mortgage guidelines in effect. Now's the time for prosperity to return. And one of the uh, other uh, proposals that came out of the Roosevelt administration that was actually signed into law was the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. Anybody know what that's more commonly known as? The GI Bill, that's right. The GI Bill, Roosevelt signed it about two weeks after um, D-Day, and it is generally considered to be uh, one of the most effective pieces of legislation uh, in the United States, in post-war era, in terms of creating wealth and actually putting people in a home. One caveat to that, anybody know what that caveat is? For the first 18 years of, it, it really, they started making loans about 1946. From 1946 to 1964, 2% of the loans were to non-whites. 2%. Now, 
Now that 2% isn't African Americans, that's African Americans, that's Asian Americans, that's Hispanics, that's Native Americans, anybody who isn't Caucasian. So 98% of those loans went to uh, whites. So as we all know, suburbs just exploded. Veterans had the ability to get a college education, veterans had the ability to buy a home. And it was, as I said, if you were in that group, it was a very successful program. Here is a veteran. Um, this is, I always have to look for his first name, Andrew. This is Andrew and Charlotte Wade and their daughter. Andrew was a, a World War II veteran, was an electrician by trade, worked at General Electric. Uh, they lived in one of those neighborhoods that we just discussed uh, near downtown. They had a daughter and were expecting another and they wanted a bigger house. Well, there's homes being built everywhere. So Andrew wanted, he had the money, he had the, uh, the desire to move out and get a different kind of home in the suburbs. In this case, Shively. Um, but every time he went to buy a home or even look at a house, he was closed out. And one of the reasons he was closed out is because most deeds in Louisville, as in other parts of the country, had racial restrictions. Racial restrictions here um, always talks about not of the white or Caucasian race. Uh, so that racial restriction is right above restrictions on animals. But this was common across the United States, not just below the Mason-Dixon line, but above the Mason-Dixon line. So he had, there was a problem. He couldn't get to the point where he could buy a house. So he had some friends, and a lot of you may know this story. He had some friends, the Bradens, Carl and Ann Braden. And they worked a deal where Andrew gave them the money, they went to the closing, they bought the house, or they, they bought the house, and then they turned right around and conveyed it to the waves. Now that picture I showed you earlier was a close-up. This is the actual picture in a little broader profile. As you can see, the Wades are standing in front of a house that looks like it's had a little bit of trouble, doesn't it? Well, that's because as soon as they moved in, somebody threw rocks through the window. Uh, shortly thereafter, crosses were burned in the yard. Uh, they had people that were literally staying there all the time, their friends helping them protect themselves. And it culminated in the back half of the house being blown up. Somebody placed a bomb right under the little girl's window. Luckily, the uh, Wades weren't home when it happened, so nobody was injured. Well, this was uh, big news in Louisville, and the grand jury was convened. An investigation was conducted, arrests were made, a trial was held, and a conviction in jail time was imposed, which I don't know about you, but that seems pretty reasonable if somebody's trying to blow up my house. What do you think? Well, who here knows the twist of that story? What was, it, what, what was a little bit of a twist about that story I just told? Well, who can tell me the twist of this story? The Bradens and some of the people that had helped the Wades defend the house were charged with sedition, overthrowing the Commonwealth of Kentucky by, by stirring up trouble between the races, by in, uh, helping a black person buy a house in a white neighborhood. He did. He absolutely did. He did. Trial was held on Carl first. He was given 15 years in the penitentiary and a $5,000 fine. Uh, that sentence was eventually overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court, who ruled that sedition couldn't be, it was a federal crime, not a state crime. But that's an example of what happened when an African American tried to buy a house in a white, considered to be a white neighborhood. I've got one story I'm going to tell you about a friend of mine. This is Ernest Jasmine. Uh, Ernie Jasmine was the first black Commonwealth attorney uh, in Jefferson County and I believe in Kentucky. Later was a Jefferson Circuit Court judge. Uh, I'm friends with uh, Judge Jasmine's daughter and he, she told me this story recently that uh, after he had had a few years under his belt as an attorney, 
uh, starting to build a little success. They wanted a bigger house, so we, uh, Judge Jasmine and her mother wanted to buy a house in the Chickasaw community uh, in West Lowell, still predominantly white. This would have been about, she said about 1964, 65. But when they went out to look, they had an uncle on standby because Judge Jasmine had a relative uh, that was, lived in Baltimore who could pass for white. So that would help them buy their first house in the Chickasaw community, and this is in the mid-60s. So now let's talk a little bit about some of the long-term legacies. We've talked about the history. We know there has been a lot of federal legislation passed since this time to outlaw many of these practices. What's the legacy of these previous um, uh, laws and, and practices? Well, we're, this is where we're going to take an example. We're going to take an example. This is the Henderson home at uh, near 28th and Duminal in Louisville's Parkland community. Anybody here know anything about the Parkland community, heard of the Parkland community? Well, the Parkland community is one of the nine neighborhoods of West Louisville. Uh, and these neighborhoods all have sort of a distinctive character and, and heritage, uh, which many local folks, you know, we don't know that if we don't go to West Louisville or know anything about the history. The Parkland community was really Louisville's first suburb. Uh, it was originally founded in the 1870s. It was sort of where doctors and lawyers and maybe uh, pretty good merchants went, similar to what maybe you would go to if you were West, um, uh, old, what's now called Old Louisville. But uh, it's an area that's got some incredible buildings and it also has quite a commercial district at one time. In fact, uh, from probably right after World War II into the 1960s, it was probably the new mercantile center of uh, the African-American community, keeping in mind that the original down on Walnut Street was destroyed. Uh, that sort of changed. It was also the scene of a lot of rioting and looting in the 1968 riots, and um, the commercial center sort of hollowed out after that. Uh, anybody know the, anything about this little pink house? All right, yes. I will tell you, we would take groups from out of Louisville uh, on a tour of West Louisville, and we would go to a lot of different places, and this was always probably the spot that everybody had to have their picture taken in front of, but this is Muhammad Ali's home. Muhammad Ali was from the Parkland community. Uh, he wasn't the only uh, person of note from the Parkland community. You may recognize that other guy there. That's David Jones. David Jones, the founder, one of the co-founders of Humana, lived about six doors from the Henderson house. Uh, his family did uh, when he was growing up. So this is an area that has a very rich heritage. If you can think of Parkland for no other reason, though, think of it the next time you barbecue or are cooking that Thanksgiving turkey because it's still there. Uh, Reynolds Wrap was first produced in the Parkland community. So let's go back now. Now, this is a little hard to see here, but if you look over in the far uh, left -hand, lower left-hand corner, you see the blue note. That is where the Henderson property is in um, uh, the Parkland community. The reason I'm showing you this slide, this is just another quick historical aside, this is a little better, but it's still hard to see. So you see that main road that sort of runs through the center that kind of takes a little curve? On the right side is east, on the left side is west. So that road, as it progresses, that is Virginia Avenue is the center, is sort of the main street of the Parkland community. But it's Oak Street over here on the east, and as it goes and crosses 26th Street, it turns into Virginia Avenue. There's a number of streets in Louisville uh, West Louisville, that as they go from east to west, change their name. Anybody tell me why? Well, keeping in mind, the area closer to the center of downtown, the eastern from this area, that was where you had your African-American communities, your Irish communities, for instance, the Limerick community. Uh, once again, those least desirable or hazardous communities. So since all of the Parkland community and pretty much everything west was white, as the streets go east to west, they changed their names because people in the Parkland community didn't want to have the same name as somebody maybe that was 
less desirable. It happens several times in Louisville, and that's the reason why. And it usually occurs somewhere around 26th Street. All right, here's the family. I have to share this story as well. This is the Henderson family. The lady in the pink hat, that is Miss Edith, Edith Henderson. Late 70s, early 80s in this photograph. Uh, Edith grew up in the Deep South uh, for a period of time, lived in uh, uh, Detroit, in the Michigan area. Edith grew up picking cotton. I have literally never talked to anybody who grew up picking cotton. Uh, it was just an amazing story. Hard, tough, back-breaking work. She worked her entire life. She was sort of um, an icon on the street. Um, and, you know, she sort of, if somebody needed a meal or needed nursing care, Edith was there. And uh, Edith had, her, had some, a series of strokes. And there's two people behind her. There's two daughters behind her and her son. As Edith got to the point where she needed some care, the family decided they weren't going to put Edith in a nursing home. So these three daughters specifically rotated and stayed with their mother 24 hours a day. It is the most amazing story, and it's, it's one of those stories that's hard to, to recount and not choke up a little bit, but if I, could, if I could put a photo with the definition of family, it would be that family. So as director of Hand in Hand, I would go out about mm, once a month and talk to people who were applying for some type of project assistance. So this particular day, I went out, and I had a several different stops to make. My first stop was somebody wanted to donate a wheelchair ramp. And they had heard me speak somewhere, and they wanted to donate a wheelchair ramp in the Chickasaw community. Well, I'm thinking, you know, I'm assuming it's wooden. I'm just sort of going to go by, do kind of a pro forma thank you, but we really can't move a wooden wheelchair ramp. When I get to this location, though, I find it's a metal wheelchair ramp, and the, the resident wants to give it to somebody. Literally, my next stop that day was the Henderson household. I walk up, and it's like, hey, what do you guys need? Well, mom is in a wheelchair now, and we really like to have a ramp to get her in and out of the house so we could take her to church. That's really the big thing that she wants to do more than anything. We like to take her to the doctor, et cetera, too. And could you put some handrails in the bathroom for her? Okay, so we ended, to make a long story short, there was one bathroom in this house. This is an amazing house. It has a staircase that's about six feet wide. Looks like something that somebody in Edwardian or Victorian dress would come down. And um, there was one bathroom in the house, huge house, bathrooms upstairs. So I said, so where's your mom's bedroom? Oh, it's downstairs on the first floor, it's easier. So one bathroom on the second floor? How does your mom get to the bathroom? We carry her. So Edith was, they had put her bedroom downstairs in what had been the old dining room. This is a grand house. So I'm looking in this, and me and the other project manager, we, I looked at this and I said, we can't tell this family what we're thinking. But we were looking around and we said, I think we can put a bathroom in this, at the end of this bedroom. And we can make it barrier free. So with a lot of contributions and some <laughs> just real luck, we did it. So what you have on the left is what it looked like before when there were just closets. This room was big enough for us to build her a bathroom at the end of her bedroom. This is another view of it. We had a uh, low barrier shower that was donated by Marvin Mazur. Put in a picture for Marvin Mazur. Uh, we just had incredible contributions and a lot of people came from all over the country to help us do this for her. This was the other room. Uh, once again, this is just, we, we were able to create a whole little, um, a new area for her because, and she had a hospital bed in there. And this was the final day when we were done. And there's Edith again, but we had the whole crew there that particular day. So anyway, we were able to put in a wheelchair ramp, add a barrier-free bathroom uh, for her, uh, there were some other things that we did that we did for the house as well, but this all enabled Edith not to have to go to a nursing home. Now, as a family member, uh, and even just an economics uh, exercise, would you consider this to be a pretty good investment? This is the wheelchair ramp. This was the one that was totally donated. We took it down from one area 
Uh, I will tell you this, anybody here a Trinity or St. X grad? Well, the Trinity and St. X had a competition over which of the groups could help build this ramp the fastest, and they did it in a weekend. Uh, but anyway, so now Edith has an ability to get in and out of her house and to use a bathroom without having to be carried. So now let's turn back to the house. This is the outside of the house again. There was also some vinyl siding added to the house. As you can see, this is a large home. Structurally, it is in amazing shape. So now I want to pick two volunteers. Since you're right here, come on up for just a minute. You two, both of you, I know, I'm sorry. I promise you, you okay, well, can I pick you two? That's what happens when you sit on the farewell. Come on, I promise. I, this, we're going to do several folks. I, I, there's a reason why I'm doing this. This is where we're going to get into a little bit of an interactive role. So come on up. And I'm Bill. George. George. Betsy. Betsy. Nice to meet you. Okay. Uh, please tell me you won't hold this against me. Okay. So you are going to be the homeowners. You are in the situation now that we've just described with the Henderson family. You're a little more animated here than you are in your photo, but you are the homeowners. So you are not, you know, this is a lot of work. I think we would all agree, right? So you need a contractor to give you a quote on this, right? So I need two contractors here. Uh, come on up, I need one other. Give me another contractor here. How about you, sir? Come on up and be a contractor for a minute, okay? because you're going to be the contractor and you're going to help uh, and you show up at this house and we've told you what we want to do you know the scenario a little bit so <laughs> um, you know some contractors get a bad rap right we all would agree with that and there are bad contractors out there but you guys have selected this group you know they have a good solid reputation. Who better than Chip and Joanna of HDTV, right? Okay, so Chip and Joanna over here have decided, have, they look the project over and they give you a quote. And the quote is, we've got the bathroom renovation, which is a total add-on, barrier-free, $30,000. We're going to add the wheelchair ramp is 15,000. The upstairs bathroom, you know, the only bathroom in the house, it was kind of starting to fall through into Miss Edith's bedroom, so we thought it might be wise to do a little work. And we actually did add uh, grab bars, et cetera, in that bathroom. Vinyl siding, which needed to be done. So we have a total of about $67,000. Now this is a large home. You're putting all the vinyl siding on it. You're adding a barrier-free bathroom. You're putting in a wheelchair ramp. You're repairing the upstairs bathroom. $67,000 seem pretty reasonable? Yeah, I mean, come on. Anybody price projects lately? All right, so now you need to go to the bank. And this is where I'm gonna ask, Barbara, would you pass these out? Uh, and you can look, I mean, we won't need them right this second. I'm gonna go ahead and have her pass them out now. Okay, so. You guys have looked at this. You consider this a fair price for everything that you want to do? You want to keep your mother in the home? Okay. All right. So now you need to go see a banker. I need a banker. Boy, that's a role nobody wants, huh? Uh, who wants to be a banker real quick? Relatively painless. Come on up. Be a banker. Yes. Because once again, bankers get a lot of bad rap. You are not some predatory Wall Street type. Yes. And I'm Bill. Hi, Bill. Mary Jo. Mary Jo, thank you. Okay, Mary Jo. You are a good, solid community banker. You know the family. You know they have lived in this house, by the way, since 1970. Raised five kids in this house. Uh, you have lots of grandkids that come for a visit. You have great grandkids that come for visiting. And it's still a house that everybody comes to on Sunday and has dinner. You also know Chip and Joanna over here. And you know them to be reputable contractors, right? So, 
we have our homeowners going to the bank now. Mary Jo, as I said, you're a good banker. Can anybody name who would be the best example of a good, friendly community banker that you can think of? Oh, come on. <laughs> All right, so George, you are here. They've come to see you. You've gotten the quote. You consider the quote reasonable for all that work to do. Would you consider that to be a reasonable quote? Okay, do we have any copies left? Just one. Just one. Okay, well, I'm going to have to do this with the banker here. Okay, but one of the things you have to do as a banker is you have to engage in due diligence, right? I mean, you've got a lot of federal and state regulatory groups breathing down your neck. You've got all of that legislation that, believe it or not, started back in the 30s that's still here, and it's here for a reason. So you pull up, now everybody turn to this, you pull up two pieces of paper. The first piece of paper you pull up is the PVA assessment on 2741 Duminal. That's the house, okay? Now remember, we've got a $67,000 loan that you're coming for. Can you scroll down here and tell me what is the assessed value of the property? Hmm, George, you're starting to see a problem here, aren't you? All right, let's turn to the second page real quick. Because let's face it, property can be low value, but you have to look at a lot of other things, including the community, you know, is, is this an up and coming area, et cetera. So let's just glance down through the assessed history. Uh, you see a trend there? What is the trend? Just, uh, mm -hmm. one moment, we're just gonna have to, we timed out. There we go. Um, you see a problem there. It should come on in a moment. Um, if not, we'll look at it again. All right, do you see a problem there? The value of the home is going down. All right, now, we're gonna do the rest of this so I'll, everybody can sit down now, but thank you for your forbearance. I don't have any parting gifts for you, uh, but I do appreciate it. So. This is a problem. We all agree the $67,000 seems pretty reasonable. They've lived in the home since 1970, but does anybody think a bank is going to lend any of our folks here, even with Chip and Joanna doing the work, $67,000 on a home that is valued with what you see before you? That is a problem that we see over and over and over again in these areas. Keeping in mind, this area was actually uh, a yellow area. This was a uh, uh, declining area in those um, residential security maps. But this is a problem. So we have a homeowner here who's lived in this house in 1970. And if you look at the top line, in fact, you will see uh, at one point Edith uh, conveyed part of this home to uh, an interest in the home to her daughter Rose. And in October of 2005, what was the fair market value of the house? Second page, $55,000. Now, of course, you saw the current assessment on the first page. So this house has lost a significant amount of value just in this 15 years, actually 14 years, that that covers. So how do you do maintenance on properties like this? What do you do when you need a roof? Well, there's a couple of things you do. For instance, I didn't tell you the full story on the vinyl siding because what happened on the vinyl siding was they found a contractor who came around, said, I can do it for this amount. By the way, you get a lifetime warranty on it. Uh, when we showed up, there was a lot of problems with this siding. In fact, they didn't quite put it all the way to the top, so when the gutters filled up and they poured backwards, it all ran down the wall inside. Uh, we got a lifetime warranty on this, contractor said. Well, haven't been able to get the contractor on the phone. They had an address over here in Bluegrass Industrial Park. One day while we were passing through, we went to find it. Well, you can guess where the story's going. The office wasn't there. Um, so that is one legacy of having, not being able to uh, get reasonable amounts of, of, of monies to, to maintain your property. Let's forget all the other stuff for a minute. Let's forget trying to do this for Miss Edith, uh, just maintaining a property. Another problem we have is utilities. Okay. 
Uh, very quickly, when we look at, at utilities, this is another home in the Portland community. Uh, as you can see, this home has some problems on the front end. Uh, we had a crew come in and put a new front and some siding on it. You get a rough idea of the size of this house. This is the home of Anita. Anita and her family have lived here since 1970. Uh, you get a rough idea of the size of the property. It's about 900 square feet. Um, and her utility bills before the increase in the winter averaged anywhere from $650 to $800 a month. Why? Well, you can guess there's no insulation in the walls. Uh, and you have to keep the heat on, and, and, and like most of these shotguns, they're built about 18 inches off the floor. She's heating about 850 square feet there. Uh, I asked her, I, I touched base with her just to see what her latest utility bill was, and it just slightly crossed the threshold of $1,000. Uh, once again, you don't have the ability to gain cash to do things like insulation and some of the other things. Yes, there are some programs that, that theoretically you can get some help with, uh, but that is a problem. You also have a problem is when your house is built over a crawl space like this, you have to run the water to keep the pipes from freezing, so it very rarely, very often your, your water bill is over $200 a month uh, during these problems. So what do you do? Well, one of the things you do is you, you, know, you get through the winter. Sometimes your utilities get shut off in late March, early April, but you can pay it off before uh, maybe October, and the whole cycle starts over again. Finally, I just want to note some of the other things in some of these red line districts. Some of the research has shown uh, some major insurers charge minority neighborhoods as much as 30% more than other areas with similar accident costs. Uh, a lot of reasons. It's not necessarily related to claim history, uh, but studies have consistently shown that in some of these districts you have dramatically increased insurance costs for cars. Contractors. I'm pointing out contractors because what do most of us do if you need to have a, uh, work done on your house? You call a contractor, you get them out there, they give you a bid, you look it over, etc. First of all, you got to get a contractor to even come down. Some contractors will only come down if you pay a little bit before they'll even bother to show up. So you turn to things like check cashing groups and some of these other things are similar to what the Henderson family did. They were, even though that contractor had left town, the financing agreement they had made was 17% interest. Now, we all know just because a contractor left town, they've already sold the papers, so they're still obligated on the debt. All right, and finally, we're going to look at just trying to sell your house or buy a house. This is a study that was recently done. The plaintiffs say their two-year nationwide investigation shows Red Flynn was less likely to offer services, including virtual tours, et cetera, for homes listed in neighborhoods with large numbers of racial minorities. This was a, uh, an investigation just in the Louisville area. Uh, and you can see that in areas such as Russell and California, which are two of the communities in West Lowell, and I would also throw Portland in here as well, uh, were about six times more likely to be offered no service by Redfin than homes in extremely white neighborhoods such as Crescent Hill and Germantown. On a single day in 2018, there were 108 homes listed in extremely non-white zip codes. None were offered Redfin's best available service designation. By comparison, 61% of the other homes were. So I leave you with this. We've identified some of the legacies, the origins of redlining, some of the legacies of redlining, some of the, the problems you have as a homeowner. Now, what are the answers? Well, that's where I end because I don't know what the answers are. But I do want to turn to you and get some comments, some thoughts, and hopefully some ideas. So who has some thoughts or comment on anything you've seen, or just a question, for instance? I'm going to st I'll try to get everybody. Yes, ma'am.
when you have a home that you've renovated and it's nice, mm -hmm. to say, say they got their $67,000 and they were able to make all of their improvements and whatnot, and then they want to refinance it when all the wonderful interest rates came through, mm -hmm. the uh, ability of that house to, in, to show its real worth is incredibly limited mm -hmm. by the property around it. And, and that's one of the things in that parking area. The city was giving properties away for a dollar mm -hmm. if someone, if you would come in as a contractor or as a buyer mm -hmm. or whatever, and you would put in the new property. Well, the, the change time mm -hmm. from building that new home in that area and, and then being able to support the prices that you really should have for that property it, it's a real problem that mm -hmm. that uh, cycle of time mm -hmm. can can be so long that that it's detrimental to the good thought that somebody had to start with to get the property and hey let's put some affordable housing here mm -hmm. um, then to support it and go to the bank it, it can be rather challenging you need to use it one thing I forgot to do, since we are recording, we're going to pass around a mic, but to the appraisal point here, that is a really invidious problem that we, we have partnered, and I know there have been several people that have partnered that have said, I don't want to make any money on this property, but I don't want to lose money on this property. And they go and they maybe totally rehab a shotgun for $65,000. It's a beautiful home, 12 foot ceilings, perfect starter home for somebody. They go to the bank and it doesn't appraise, it may appraise for 50. And you can beg and you can plead and, and, and it just doesn't happen. And so it's one of those things where people say, hey, if you develop these areas and you can raise the comps, then it'll start feeding where you will have um, a private you know, investment coming into it. But it doesn't happen, does it? Well, they just don't bother to say how long that's gonna take. Mm -hmm. Now we have successes, you know, we have pieces like Shelby Park and some other areas that have. Uh, and of course we always have the, the, the issue of gentrification which is becoming a real issue with some people, but that, that's a great point and I'm glad you brought that up. Who else, I saw somebody over here. Yes, we're gonna bring you the mic. I just, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just had a question about the language for the like class A homes versus class B homes mm -hmm. or the, the risks for that. Where did that language live? Was that in bank regulations language or was, where was that? It's a great question. All of these residential security maps, uh, I feel like Phil Donahue here, which I know is dating me too, but um, these resident, all of these, these districts, in the residential security maps, all of these districts had a rating, you know, a geographic area and commentary. And when I said that stuff was hiding in plain sight, that's the kind of stuff that Josh Poe dug up. And it's there. It's just nobody, for, for a lot of reasons, banks for many years kind of hid this. And keep in mind, these specific, um, uh, a lot of this stuff was outlawed in the 50s, but of course it lived on. Uh, but it is actually in the commentary on these residential security maps. And they're starting to digitize some of this. There's some communities, I don't think Louisville's done it yet, but they're starting to digitize some of this so you can actually go and read in some cities. Is, is that in public records though? No, it was part of the, part of the, the FHA, the 1934 Act, when they developed these residential security maps, you had that language in there. So if you were a bank, you could pull it up and you could read, okay, this address is in X district. Let me pull it and see what it's rated and what, what's the commentary behind it. Like I said, it was, according to Josh, hidden in plain view. Yes, ma'am. Were those maps you showed us, were they from 1939? That map that I showed you is from 1937. It actually, okay. late 1937. So if you showed us a new map today, would it look pretty similar? You mean in terms of, well, suppose I mean, the residence was... It seems to me like the west side is still black, the east side is white. Well, the west side wasn't black in 1937. Okay. Except for those very close districts, it was not. I thought they were red areas. 
Well, they were, but that's what I said. And once the thing we need to remember about redlining, yes, it was it had a tr tremendously disparate effect on racial minorities, but it also had a tremendous impact on income. Income was huge. Uh, so, you know, most of those were more working class neighborhoods, good solid neighborhoods, but they were predominantly white, but they were poor. It just doesn't seem to me like we've made much progress. I wish I could disagree with you on that. I wish I could disagree. Yeah. Who else had? Wherever you want to go. <laughs> I guess EJ and then. I wish to apologize, I'm hard of hearing, and I didn't hear much of what they answered, so I may repeat, but basically I think it would, I'm saying it was a failure of, of leadership, of public leadership. My background is that I'm an architect, long retired. Mm -hmm. I did scatter site housing, uh, I did Section 8 housing, mm -hmm. and among other things, bigger I did the zoo. But anyways, the prices of 17% interest and the price of seems someone was stealing from someone. The price of uh, the there was another one of the cost a heating bill of 800 a month, mm -hmm. how many square feet? Uh, it's right at, it's less than 900 square feet. 900? Less. Mm -hmm. Well, they obviously left the windows open or... <laughs> <laughs> no, but you could, it, 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 because it was not insulated. Well, I took a, a house on Cherokee Road, built 1910. Mm -hmm. I know it because the inspection certificate was still in the electric box and had about 3,000 feet, and it didn't have any insulation. It had beveled siding nailed on the studs. Mm -hmm. That's no, what these no are. No sheathing or anything. Mm -hmm. Well, we gutted it and put insulation in and dropped the annual cost for utilities by, by about 75%. Mm -hmm. but if they had, had a, a contractor worthy of what he claimed to be, that would not have happened. I would agree. And if, if they'd had leadership, a proper advisory from the public units, that would not have happened. So I agree with you. I, I think the wrong people are being uh, being accused of doing a lot of this. Some of those that did it and didn't get caught should have been in jail. Thank you, I appreciate your comment. We had somebody right here, yes sir. Hold on, we'll get you, get you a mic. Yes sir. But actually I believe that from the time the FHA Act was passed into the 60s, Federal regulations said that an FHA loan could not be guaranteed to at least an African American, maybe a non-Caucasian. And when that was repealed, banks simply continued to follow the same concept in their redlining progress, which really made a huge negative effect on wealth building by African American communities since the biggest piece of wealth most people have is their house Very much so. and they couldn't buy they couldn't get an FHA loan to guarantee that house that's a really good point and uh, you know it's de facto versus de jure but it, it very much was was the reality uh, very much who else had a I saw wherever you want to go I'm sorry what kind of legal recourse do people did have and have now You know, of course, today there are a number of restrictions, I mean, prohibitions, I shouldn't say restrictions, and it have been since really, some of it since the 50s, but certainly since the 60s and the late 70s uh, on these type of practices. Um, 
it's hard to prove. And you know, stop and think about it. If you're already struggling to, to get a, a loan of such sort, you gotta find somebody to take your case. So it, there are, I mean, there, there, are sta it, there are statutory prohibitions on the books on it. There are penalties. You know, sometimes like with the Redfin, it's a class action that look, you know, that, that tries to go after some of this, but on individual properties, it's tough. It really is. Who else? I saw over here we had a question somewhere, I thought. Yes, ma'am. Um, first of all, I don't know what Redfin is. I'm sorry? I don't know what Redfin is. It's a, it's a real estate listing. It's, it, there's like Zillow and, oh, okay. and okay. yeah, okay. There, there's, there's a number of them. Yeah. So my question is, is there any interface or accountability between the FHA and the banks? Is there any kind of like, is there an area there that could address this? Well, both of them have inspector generals that will go out and look at specific complaints. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll throw out another even, you know, even more murky situation, because you mentioned earlier about a, a contractor who renovates a house. We worked with several contractors, or, or I really should say Good Samaritans, that wanted to invest properties in specific blocks in West Louisville with the idea we're going to raise the comps in this area. So they would do the work, we would do some of it with volunteer, we'd do it at a great price, we still couldn't get above the appraisal that a bank was giving. Well, that's okay, because there's a lot of community lending standards that banks, you know, can provide. But it is just, it, it's like pulling teeth. And I'm not saying anybody's doing it intentionally, but it's like nobody, I almost want to say, maybe we, none of us like to think outside the box, and I think sometimes that's what we need. So. I haven't really seen any of this happen. There's some banks on occasion that have been accused of it. You know, there's always a consent decree that goes into effect where we're not going to admit anything, but we're going to do this and we're going to do that. I don't know what kind of real impact it has. Well, not to beat the same drum, but the FHA um, regulations put additional stipulations on the appraisers when they went out to do an FHA loan appraisal and a regular bank loan appraisal. And uh, some of those regulations were really good because it was designed to protect the uh, person getting the loan, knowing full well that that person probably did not have any additional cash to make any repairs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So in lots of ways, the FHA loan was a good thing for the person asking for it, mm -hmm. but it was a little harder to get it. Uh, but the housing boom, et cetera, that took place in the 80s, that was, that was f a false, that was just false sense of property appraisal and improvement values and the reality of what was actually happening is the people who could least afford to be taken advantage of are the ones who all of these fly-by-night mortgage companies would go in and offer them, okay, I will give you a mortgage. ABC Bank won't, but I will. But then when you look at the fine print, you see what the interest rate is and the interest rates are outlandish and closing costs were inflated. And during that period of time, uh, or the beginning of that time, I was actually in uh, West Virginia. And, and I would go into homes and the people were wanting to refinance their house and they were already at 125% of the value of the home to start with. And then they would get mad at the appraiser and the new bank, et cetera, because they couldn't get a loan. And, uh, you know, where's the logic in that? You're loaning them more than the property's even worth, no matter what you look at. So as far as being accountable, there were a lot of folks out there that were not being held accountable. And that's, that's why we had the boom, and then we had the crash. And correct me if I'm wrong, when, because I guess particularly like the, everything that was going on in 2006, 2008, 
they changed the rules on appraisals, didn't they? I mean, they tightened up a lot of the standards, uh, or did they not? Sometime during that time period, because you had appraisers going out uh, appraising these properties at ridiculous amounts, so somebody could get the loan, you know, it was a whole feeding frenzy there. And didn't they change some of the, the appraisal standards? Well, or maybe just started maybe. to follow them. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, but you know, the damage was done. Mm -hmm. And it was just like the, the homes that went to wreck and ruin, and then you try to bring them up, and you had the, um, you know, you have some people out there who are honest and are trying to make things work right, but then there are a certain amount of rules and regulations that you have to go by, and no matter how much you want to help that person, eh, you can't necessarily do it and and still live true to yourself and what's a really appropriate i mean are you going to prove somebody who's already underwater to help them get further underwater mm -hmm. and you know i want to close by um you know we, we talked a lot about problems here tonight and some of the legacies and some of these continuous almost circular things that happen you just can't seem to get off this this, uh, this circular firing squad. But I also think we're aware of it, we're talking about it, and, and I feel very strongly, maybe I'm just being naive, but I think by doing this, we can at least work towards some solutions. I don't think there's any one solution. One of the reasons I disagree with Richard Rothstein's book is I think he sort of places all of the blame on government policies. If we change the government policies, this will change. You know, keeping in mind, these residential security maps and some of the conclusions they were drawing, a lot of that was because of the attitudes that were prevalent at the time. I mean, we know that. You know, race was part of, of you know, it still is, but, it, but race and poverty were, were central to the, you know, and people were making judgments based on that. So the fact that we're aware of it, the fact that we're talking about it, I think is a great first step. I think we can come to some s solutions here. Uh, but we're not going to do it unless we're talking about it, unless we're aware of it, and hopefully at some point putting some boots on the ground. So I do think there's optimism here. I mean, Louisville has right now uh, needs about 40,000 housing units. We're that short uh, by some statistics. And we're not going to build those overnight. We're not going to solve it overnight. But we have a just one last statistic. In 1950, the nine neighborhoods of West Louisville had 150,000 people approximately in them. That's what the census said. The latest census, it comes in just under 50. So in 70 years, these neighborhoods have lost uh, two-thirds of their population. You got an infrastructure there that would support a lot more housing and a lot more development. So there is an opportunity here. I, I have to look at it that way, but I do think that what, we're do what you're doing tonight is a great first step, and um, let's figure out what the next step is. And together, I think we can make some progress. So I do appreciate your interest, and if you had any other comments or, or questions, I really would welcome them. very much, Bill. Um, we are so appreciative of your time and your expertise. And um, he also don we donated some money to Hand in Hand Ministries in honor of uh, Bill and this talk. Um, Susan Turner, do you want to come speak about our next speaker next week? Speakers. Thanks. Um, we are really lucky next week to have the two speakers that we have coming because they are um, both involved in um, uh, lobbying the legislature in support of their constituents and are pretty darn busy right now in both Frankfurt and in, um, in um, Louisville with Metro Council. And that they're putting aside time to do this for us is, is really wonderful. Um, Tony Curtis, not the actor, um, <laughs> but uh, Tony Curtis is the executive director of the Metro Housing Coalition which represents, uh, which involves about 300 individuals and organizations in coalition in support of fair, accessible, and affordable housing. 
um, and he will be one of our speakers. And our other speaker is uh, George Eklund, who is the Director of Education and um, Advocacy for the Coalition for the Homeless, which involves over 30 organizations that work in the, in the uh, services to the homeless. So both of them are um, very knowledgeable in both in terms of um, uh, the, the, the many facts that they know about, but also the breadth of the problems of, their, of the people that they are uh, that they are concerned about helping, uh, which are also the ones that we're talking about here in this Matthew 25 initiative. And um, so I'm really pleased that they're coming, and I hope everybody will come and ask somebody else to come with you and um, try to help spread this story. Thank you very much for coming.